Listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with former England fast bowler Steve Harmison for another busy show. We'll hear exclusively from both England white ball captain Joss Butler and England wicketkeeper batter Sam Billings as uh, we prepare for the 2024 season. We'll get their thoughts on potentially playing in the MLC, Major League Cricket, in the future. We'll also reflect on Darren Goff's departure as director of cricket from Yorkshire and how they now move forward. Talk Sports cricket editor John Norman will join us to discuss the life of a journeyman Red Bull cricketer and Namibian all-rounder David Visa joins us to look at the release of his brand new podcast, Hitman for Hire, a year in the life of a franchise cricketer and they don't come busier than David Visa. So plenty to come over the next hour. This is Following On. Well, Harmi, let's start with uh, with Goffey, the news that our um, Talk Sport cricket commentator colleague has left his role as director of cricket. I mean, he was he he took the position. He was appointed in the most stressful of, of times, um, you know, right in the, the midst of the Azim uh, Azim Rafiq racism scandal. Um, he was instrumental, I think, in the appointment of Otis Gibson as head coach, and Yorkshire were then relegated. So, um, I mean, he had an awful lot to put right. Relegation definitely wasn't in the plans. Do you think um, that it's time for a move? Obviously, Goffey thinks it's time for a move. He stepped down. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was natural. It was a natural progression from uh, Colin Graves is, you know, being brought back to be a lead and chair the uh, the Yorkshire County Cricket Club. Um, I spoke to Goffey briefly, and he seemed to be happy with where he's at. Um, we got well, the conversation got cut off, so I, you know, I didn't have a great deal of time with him. But he was he was out, and I think he was out in India or Dubai doing his job. He was working hard for for Yorkshire, and that's what he's done. There's been a, a couple of articles wrote about him. I think one by the former physio, which it was disappointing to see that headline because. Um, I couldn't believe when Darren Goff first took over at the Yorkshire County Cricket Club, when he first mentioned it to me, I just laughed at him. I said, you are joking. And he was like, I said, you're going to leave Talk Sport for, for Yorkshire. And he went, it's my home club. I've got to, they're in trouble. And as soon as he said that, I knew that, that he was going to you know, be part of something which is going to turn, help turn it, turn it round. And he did, and he did it brilliantly. Um, and now, well, let's see what let's see what happens. You know, the world was watching Yorkshire for for the last sort of two years, and when Azim Rafiq, rightly so, made you know strong allegations towards the cricket club, and whatever was said, whatever was proven, and there were some good people lost jobs. I think, unfortunately, and I think some of them didn't deserve to. I think some of them possibly did deserve to. Um, but at the end of the day, Darren Darren Goff walked into into a a difficult situation. Yeah, he walked. He walked into a difficult situation. The cauldron he walked into was ready for Darren to put his chest out and say, "I'm a proud Yorkshireman. I'm going to try and rebuild this county and get people talking about it in a positive way." And I think he did that. I think he did that. I think the structure he put in place. I went in right at the very start with him to just to give him a, a little bit of a hand. Um, and there's some great people at Yorkshire. So the players were fantastic during that that three months I was involved with it at the start, and it was a difficult place to be. Um, and I think Darren's, I think Darren's rebuilt some some wounds that I think were were very very difficult. And you know where he goes now, I'm not so sure. Where Yorkshire go now? Well, the eyes of the world were on them for the, you know, at that time when Darren went in, I think they're even more on them now. I think their next appointments have got to be so so crucial, so critical that they get this one right because if they don't, then um is cricket going backwards. Um I think that's my only concern. Colin Graves going in, I've got no opinion of that. But where he goes from now after you know to replace Darren Goff to what Yorkshire went through, to where they are now, to where they are hopefully heading. Um, these appointments are so important, for not just for Yorkshire Cricket Club, but for cricket and for, for sport around the world. So that is, watch this space. Goffey should be proud of everything he's done at, at Yorkshire. I think he's been amazing. And I think the players will, I hope the players will think that as well. Um, he's got an international coach leading the club. 
Um, he's got some va- fine coaches working throughout the system. I've seen Yorkshire's youth setups. You know, they came to Ashton last you know, two years ago, the end of 15s, seen, seen the 15s and 14s play this year. Um, and they've, they're doing everything right. They're doing everything properly. Um, so that f- makes me feel as though Darren Goff, it, it, it's, it's, it's not an understatement that he's left it in a better place than when he took it over because he, he couldn't have get in a worse situation to take it over. But now he's gone. Um, I hope history tells its story, which is Darren Goff did a hell of a lot of good. I'm not just saying this because he's one of my best mates. Just think what he's done for Yorkshire Cricket Club in the last two years. I think history hopefully will show in years and years to come that he was part of something that was to rebuild the trust in Yorkshire that was, you know, sadly broken by, you know, was it twenty years, was it thirty years, was it forty years? Who knows? But something wasn't right at Yorkshire, and hopefully Darren's gonna Darren's help rebuild it. Okay, just before we move on, changing subject, um, and uh, I echo all of your sentiments about Goffey and what he achieved and 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 tried to achieve, and I hope that he will be appropriately remembered in the future if and when Yorkshire rebuild themselves. But um, just before we move on to Joss Butler and the interesting topic about the MLC Major League base uh, Major League Cricket, um, I, uh, there's another county story that's caught my attention: Marcus Harris replacing Will Pukowski as Leicestershire's overseas player. Um, Pukowski is 26 years old now, and he is probably one of the most concussion-prone players in professional cricket, the history of professional cricket. I think it was his 13th concussion that uh, he suffered uh, recently playing in the Sheffield Shield. Um, He's had two season-long sabbaticals, but it seems that he is more prone than anybody else, and a lot of people have said that he should be stopped um, from playing and it reminds me Harmi without getting too bleak about things of the words of the, the late great Ed and Senna when asked uh, about driving Formula One before the it became a very safe sport and he said it's what I do it's simple as that it's what I do and I, I wonder you know I mean think back to 26 year old yourself and compared to now 20 years later um, mm. do you think well, it's a terribly difficult subject, isn't it? It's so, yeah. It, it, and I think it's such a, <clears throat> is it a personal side, a personal subject, personal decision? Is it? Is it one that, you know, it, it, people might say it's got to be taken out of his hands. Well, it can't be, it shouldn't be taken out of his hands because, you know, what else is, if it was me, I'm looking around and going, well, what else can I do? Can't do anything else. I've got no GCSEs. I didn't even take any exams. You know, I left school when I was about 13, 14. I had no interest in school. All I wanted to be was a professional footballer or a professional cricketer when I, when I started playing. So for somebody to say he's got to stop, wow, that's hard. That's so difficult. If it's a you know, long-term injury and you've got no choice, then you've got no choice. And it, 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 it is a difficult one. You know, in my in this job with Talk Sport, I've I've done a show called After the Lights Go Out and I interviewed along with the great man, Leon McKenzie. And I interviewed Steve Thompson, who was 42 year old, who suffering from dementia, played in the World Cup final, you know, struggles to you know, remember what, you know, he can't remember the World Cup final, struggles to remember Keith's kids' names at some, sometimes. And, you know, that the rugby is suing the RFU because they didn't feel as though right things were put in place. Now, it's a difficult one. I think it's such a such a personal um, decision you make by having to give the game up because, you know, for, you keep getting hit on the head by, by bouncers. But if you give the game up, where do you go? What do you do? You know, where will your next sort of phase in life become? I, I think it's such a difficult subject to, to sort of cover and say definitively, yes, he should pack in. Because it's easy for me, 10,000 miles away, saying, yes, he should pack in. But uh, I can understand Leicester replacing him. Yes, that's a good thing. Um, I think it's up to Will Pukowski if what he go, where he goes you know, for his next phase of his career. And many people can advise him and say, yeah, I think you should. But uh, for me, decisions like that should come down to the individual. You know, you know the risks. You understand what's going on. Um, 
but it's my career, it's my life. I'm the one who makes the decisions. And yes, it's, it's unfortunate, but I think it's such a touchy subject where I think I just think it's a personal decision, that one. Okay, um, it is very, very difficult. And he's a very fine cricketer, by the way. Um, yes. So, you know, it's not like he's a struggling journeyman. He's a, he's a very, very fine, well above average cricketer. And I think he would have, Manners, he would have played for Australia. He would have played for Australia. Yeah. I think he would have played for Australia if he hadn't has had as many concussions as he, as he has. But unfortunately, you know, this is, this is where he's at. But you know, there's no question and that's what makes it makes it harder decision because he is such a fine, fine player. All right, lots to fit in. So let's hear now, as promised, from England white ball captain Joss Butler. He was speaking at an event at the 108 in London, promoting Major League Baseball's London Games in June. He's been speaking to Talk Sports Scott Taylor and was asking, and uh, he was asked by Scott if playing in the MLC interests him at some time in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, would love to. I think um, you know, seeing cricket expand and become a, even more of a global game and into countries it's not been a part of before would be fantastic. So, um, yeah, and America's somewhere I've not spent much time at all. So, uh, yeah, I'd be, be keen to go there. Have you spoke to Liam Plunkett? He's obviously a big advocate of cricket in America. He helped sort of launch MLC. Have you, have you been speaking to him about it? A little bit, yeah. Um, you know, I think um, obviously you've been... Uh, living there for a while as well and obviously he's done a lot of work and very involved in that so um, I think it was the first season wasn't it last year of Major League Cricket so uh, it'd be interesting to see the how it um, has developed and, and moved on this year as well um, and uh, yeah hopefully at some point in the future um, could be a part of it. And how are you feeling now you've you've had the World Cup you've had some time in South Africa how are you feeling ahead of 2024 in the new season. Yeah, feeling good, feeling refreshed. Um, no, I think South Africa at the start of the year was brilliant for me. I um, really enjoyed the tournament, uh, enjoyed playing for the Power Royals last year, and this year was just the same. Uh, nice to have a, you know, change is good. You know, change of environment, some different people, and get out of the England bubble for a little bit. Um, it, it's good sometimes, um, and then had a, a bit of a quiet time now before, obviously a busy period with the IPL and, and the World Cup as well. So lots to look forward to. Yeah, one of those you mentioned, look forward to the T20 World Cup. Is there something that you can take away from the, the last World Cup? I know it's different format, different country, but the fact that your hold is in this one as well, is there maybe something that you've learned as an individual and as a captain ahead of this T20 World Cup? Yeah, I learned loads of things um, throughout that, that phase. Um, and I think it's sort of the hallmark of, of all players. You're always trying to learn and improve and get better and learn from your mistakes as much as you learn from the things you do right. So, um, yeah, there's certainly elements as a player and captain. You're always factoring that into your game um, and to, to really go out there and look forward to, to the T20 World Cup. You know, it's, it's great to be going into it as, as defending champions. And um, But, you know, we're very sort of aware as where we're at as a team right now, um, how much growth there is for improvement. And, and T20 cricket is, um, you know, there's sort of certain moments where the game will, will fall either way and it's about winning those big moments. And just how beneficial was that series in the West Indies in December in terms of local knowledge, I guess, ahead of the, the T20 World Cup? Yeah, a really good series for us to go there and, and play and sort of see you know, guys get exposed to their conditions. Um, you know, obviously seeing the grounds and the way the wind plays a big factor in, in the Caribbean. Uh, and also we'll have Kieran Pollard as part of our coaching staff, which um, you know, will bring a lot of obviously local expertise, but um, you know, just a lot of T20 knowledge. He's, he's played more than anyone uh, in the world, won a lot of tournaments. So really looking forward to you know, personally tapping into his, um, his brain. And, and I know the team will be as well. There's been a couple of stories about some of your Lancashire teammates. We'll start off with Phil Salt. There's been a lot of talk about him maybe getting a test call up this summer. What, how would you rate his chances? And, and do you think they need to change that, that folks' best though, conundrum? Or... Um, yeah, selection in test cricket, certainly nothing to do with me. So, um, But they've got, they've, there's a number of fantastic players there. You know, um, you spoke about folks and best. They've been excellent players and brilliant in their own right. Um, and I'm sure, you know, Phil Salt is a number of, of guys around the country who are, you know, desperate to play well and perform and, and have ambitions to play for England in all formats. And Tom Hartley, he did well in India. How did you assess his tour? 
Yeah, I thought he did really well. Um, it was always going to be a tough ask of of the, um, the young spinners, um, you know, especially since when Jack Leach got injured and you know, the senior spinner. Um, you know, so I thought those guys stepped up really well. I thought you know, it's not an easy place to go and, and play. And um, obviously conditions are you know, favourable for bowling spin, but you're playing against a, a top team and in and and high pressure situation in test cricket. So I thought he handled himself really well. And just finally, Again, on the T20 World Cup, there's a lot of England players now that play franchise tournaments all over the world. How beneficial is that? And how much are you looking forward to that tag as defending champions this time around? Yeah, I think um, yeah, there's loads of franchise cricket now. And um, you know, it's certainly a really important part that people are always looking at how the guy's going. It, it can be a really good measure. You know, you're playing against some top players in franchise cricket. And, you know, the IPL is... You know, as high a standard as any cricket you can play. All the best players in the world are there playing against each other. So everyone will always be keeping an eye on how people are going and, and stuff and um, planning accordingly, looking forward to, let's say, playing in that World Cup in, in June. That was England white ball captain Josh Butler speaking to Talk Sports Scott Taylor at the 108 in London promoting Major League Baseball's London Games. And you can watch the full interview on the Talk Sport Cricket YouTube channel. Um, a couple of things just to finish off this section then, Harmy. Um, is that a, a just a throwaway comment from Josh Butler, um, pleasing the sponsors about one, uh, wanting to play in the uh, MLC, even though it uh, clashes with the T20 Blast? And in the same breath, Alex Hales um, is going to miss some fixtures for Nottinghamshire in the T20 Blast after signing a deal to play in the Sri Lankan Premier League, or the Lanka Premier League. Um, so uh, are, are these warning signs? But I mean, Josh Butler's much more important, of course, being the England white ball captain. But is is that a worry or or not really? Um, not really, not really. Yeah, you know, <laughs> does he have to play? Does he have to play in the blast? Is it if it's the best? If it's the best tournament, then you'd urge him to play in the best tournament. Is it a is it a kick? Is it a wake up call for ECB to understand that? You know we. We don't own the game. We don't run the game. We don't rule the game. Is it a, a, a possible wake-up call to if we don't bring in if we don't bring in the sort of franchise side of it and we don't have more investment to pay our players, you know, in in the in the shortest form of the game, which is the most exciting form of the game, which in theory should be the ones that we put bums on seats, then we're going to lose them to the you know, to the the bigger. Uh, bigger tournaments, the, the tournaments which have got more money. Um, it's a slight concern because he's England captain, but it wouldn't stop me from picking Josh Butler for playing for England if he doesn't play for Lancashire in the T20 Blast and he goes and plays with Liam Plunkett in America for five games, if that five-game tournament is a, is a good tournament, it's a top tournament. You know, is it a wake-up call to ECB to say, well, you know, you've got to somehow get the 100 and the Blast together, marry it up, and you know, get our house in order because our our our, our players don't see that is our is the is the top priority. They see the hundred as a top priority. They don't see the blast as a top priority. So- I just think, Harmy, that we go back to a subject we've spoken about a lot in the past. I think uh, in order for the credibility of all of these tournaments to survive, I think that the players should uh, be required to pick and choose. I mean. Playing half of the blast and then popping over to the MLC and playing a few games there uh, and playing overlapping tournaments, I don't think does the tournaments or the yep. players' credibility any good at all. But we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, uh, and we've, uh, that's an ongoing subject. <laughs> we'll be speaking about it for years to come. You're listening to Following On here on TalkSport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, and former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And next up, we'll be joined by Namibian all-rounder David Visa to discuss the life of a freelance cricketer. You're listening to Following On with me, Neil Manthorpe, and Double Ashes winner Steve Harmison. And a reminder, you can now watch us as well on YouTube. Just head over to the TalkSport Cricket YouTube channel to subscribe. As promised in the, in the uh, introduction, we are now joined live by former South Africa and current Namibia all-rounder David Visa to discuss life as a freelance cricketer around the world. A brilliant concept, I have to say. A magnificent hitman for hire, a year in the life of a franchise cricketer. We've been speaking about uh, franchise cricketers, well, probably for about 20 years since uh, the first West Indians became freelance and refused national contracts. But David's in a a slightly different uh, situation, a different position. Um, In the, um, (laughs) I was about to use the red wine analogy, in the twilight of your career, it seemed to be getting better and better. 
But David, what what seriously I actually mean it? I know it's a cliche, but but what prompted you to to do this series? I mean, it's it, it's fascinating. I, Harmy and I have only heard a couple of clips. You can't wait to get get really stuck into it. But what motivated it? Yeah, first of all, hi guys, and thanks for having me on your show. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, it was actually just an idea that that we had uh, myself and Sam Kerr, who who does the podcast with me. Um, you know, I think everybody is talking about franchise cricket at this stage. It's, it, it's all over the place. There's, there's such a big bubble at this stage. There's so many tournaments. But I don't think people actually know what goes on behind the scene. They see the glitz and the glamour. They see all the tournaments and, you know, the big cash bonuses, everything. But they don't actually know what goes on behind the scenes and, and how it actually affects the players, affects the families, everything. You know, we just came up with this concept. Um, you know, last year... I was fortunate to play in, you know, pretty much almost every single tournament that was there. And it just kind of fell in place perfectly for us just to, you know, almost document a year in the life of, of what a franchise cricketer goes through. And um, have you spoken to, to, the, to the hard truth, David? Because um, I, I, what prompts me to say that is Adil Rashid, to my mind, is the only franchise cricketer who has admitted that, that it is difficult practically and emotionally moving from team to team to team um you know and he he admitted that uh, there were days when he had to try and think who the coach was and and it's very well to sort of clasp the badge on your shirt and say you know i'm gonna uh run through a brick wall for this team but you have to remember which team you're playing in at that moment yeah that, that does get challenging um you know every single month you're playing for a different team you're playing for different coach and different players and you know, you've got to almost keep it in perspective in, in what it's, you know, what it's there. And, and you know, for me, it's just a playing franchise cricket is it's a fantastic opportunity just to showcase your skills. Um, you know, it's, it's, you get to go and travel all the places in the world that, you know, me personally, I would never have gone to if, if it wasn't for cricket. And, you know, and financially, obviously, there's always that incentive also. And, you know, it is tough on the families. It is tough on the players. And, you know, you essentially only one bad tournament away from being retired. Um, and, and that does put a lot of stress on you. But, you know, it's what we've signed up for and we're fortunate enough to be able to do what we love. And David, you got, you know, obviously the, the franchise cricket now is, is obviously 12 months. Just run us through what a, a franchise cricket calendar looks like. So somebody like yourself, you know, they're going around the world and place to place. What does it actually you know, feel like and look like for, for you as an individual? Yeah, so, you know, for the first time now, you can actually start picking and choosing because there's so many tournaments and they're overlapping. You almost, you know, you have so much opportunities out there that you, know, you, you almost got to think, you know, what's best for you as a player. It's all well and good trying to go play every single tournament. But, you know, there is mental fatigue there. You know, you know physically you get tired. And, you know, especially if you have a family at home, it's, it's difficult to be away the whole time. So, you know, I mean, if I have to just think of myself last year, I went... I left for Dubai for the ILT20 on the 4th of January. I went straight from there to Pakistan. Then I was home for four days, straight from there. Then there I went to the IPL, straight to the UK for the Blast, straight to America for the Major League, straight back to the UK for you know, the 100. And then I only eventually got home on about the 25th or the 26th of August. So I spent about six days at home um, you know, for the first eight months of the year. And it, and that was an exceptional circumstance. You know, you, you don't have to play all of those tournaments, but I just saw that as a great opportunity for me to learn as a player and, you know, just to go out, you know, like Neil said, I'm in the twilight now, so there's not a lot of opportunities that's going to come my way anymore. So, you know, I just took that on as a challenge. But, you know, it does get tough after, you know, about the third or fourth tournament, you start thinking and questioning, you know, maybe you're sacrificing too much, maybe you're being away from your family too much. You know, there are always those things in the back of your mind. And there's quite a few things in that. You know, me and Manners have spoke about, you know, over the last couple of years about, you know, with like Alex Stewart talking about from a club's point of view and how they look after the franchise cricketers. Is this a, a little bit like a golfer? And are we going down the sort of golfer's route, which is the pick and choose tournaments where they play around the world and potentially have their own teams as individuals, i.e. you have your own fitness coach, you have your own batting coach, your own bowling coach. As, a, as an individual, so you, you come less as a team member rather than it, an individual sort of commodity going into this because it just seems as though, you know, like Man has mentioned before, you know, you've got this team, you've got that team, you've got another team, but you as an individual have got to be the best version of yourself to make sure that you are pre prepared right for these teams. Are we going down that yeah. route from like, like a golfer's type? 
I think it could be. I mean, there are a couple of the guys that actually travel with their own, you know, you, you want to call it a performance director or whatever, mm. you know, just someone who, who they've worked with as a as a S&C, as a strength and conditioning coach, as a physio, you know, they'll, they'll bring them on. And I think also that became quite prevalent in the COVID times where you had to be in a bubble the whole time. You know, you, you actually just bring somebody along that, that you get on with, that you can spend time with. Um, and that just makes touring a little bit easier. But, you know, like you said, it's, it's getting to that stage where, you know, you as an individual become such an important commodity that, you know, if you don't look after yourself, because that's the one challenging thing that I found as a franchise cricketer is that you don't have a home base. So when you're not playing, you kind of have to look after yourself. You have to get your own physios. You have to organize your own training. You Sometimes you have to pay for facilities. You have to, you know, ask old clubs if you can use their nets and get somebody to throw balls at you. So that is the challenging side of it. And I think it's it's going to move towards that where, you know, you'll find guys traveling with their own coaches or their own performance managers, um, you know, just to make sure they're getting the best out of themselves. David, I've obviously got experience of touring, having done it for over 30 years, and I've just spent two months on the road now. And obviously um, I don't get uh, offered the big bucks doing my job. But if somebody said to me... <laughs> Um, would you uh, would you go on the road for eight months? I I would I honestly uh, would have to say no. Um, I mean you you've touched on it there, but the the support that you need from a mental health perspective must be enormous. I, I mean I, one bit I did hear as well is you throw in the security in the PSL for example. <laughs> And that's yet another kind of weight on your mind. You said there's like five or six thousand people involved in the security operation just for a practice session. Yeah, it, it is insane. I mean, the the PSL is is a is a own beast. You know, you until you actually go play there, you, you don't actually understand the intricacies of, of what actually goes on there. But it's a tournament that I love playing. I, I think it's a fantastic tournament and. You know, I've, I've said that the Calandas is the one team that's actually, you know, almost sparked my career again because you know, they gave me the opportunity to go play there. But, um, yeah, you're, you're right there. I mean, it is a daunting challenge to, to take on, like you say, you know, eight months at a time. And, you know, it didn't actually, for me, start out that way. Um, you know, it just sort of compounded. I, I started off in Dubai and then the PSL. I wasn't expecting to get an IPL contract and that came along. So that usually took away you know, two months where I would be at home. Then the blast came along, which I'd signed for already because I enjoyed my time in Leeds. Um, the major league wasn't something that I was bargaining on, but then that came along as a new tournament. So we're like, okay, let's give it a go. And then the 100 got signed there. So, yeah, it's, it's nothing that you, you almost set out to do, but it just compounded on me. And, and at the end, you know, you never want to be in that situation where you're not able to give your best. But I, I did feel towards the end, you know, Every time you go step across the boundary onto the field, you're always giving your 100%. But, you know, there are times when you get to training sessions where, where you just start you know, lacking a bit of motivation towards the end. And that's when you know, okay, you know, maybe it's time that you need to step back now and just, you know, take a bit of time for yourself. And, David, do you think franchise cricketers and, you know, franchise cricket itself gets a bad name because of what, you know, the traditional, you know, older you know, cricket loving followers with red ball cricket and test match cricket. Do you think, you know, the franchise gets a bad name because of that? I think there are the, the purists in the game that's going to go and, you know, always push push against franchise cricket. Um, you know, for me, myself, I, I think they can both coincide. You know, I think international cricket and franchise cricket can coincide. Um, it, it's up to the players at the end of the day. You know, I've always said that, you know, international cricket is playing for your country should always be your number one and the franchise cricket is almost a reward for your performances that you've done internationally. Um, you know, franchise cricket is such a fickle world that if you just go put all your eggs in one basket, you know, you have one, like I said, you have one or two bad tournaments and then, you know, your career is almost over. So, you know, I, I always like to think that, you know, you, you've always got to focus mainly on your international career, on playing for your country and then maybe towards the back end or, you know, when you start reevaluating things a little bit. And, and once you've actually learned your game and now you just want to focus on specific skills, then you can maybe become more of a mercenary. But, you know, for me, I almost get a little bit sad when I see the younger guys, the 21, 22-year-olds who are already you know, leaving the red ball cricket just to go focus on, on white ball. I think, you know, you're missing out on a big chunk of learning and, you know, a massive part of your career if you're doing that. 
David, I'm famous for asking two questions in one because I, I'm, I hate running out of time. But so I want to ask you about Namibia's games against England, Australia. You, you got you got the big two. You're not playing India, but you've got England and Australia in the T20 World Cup. So your thoughts on that. But what I really want to know is after eight months on the road, what are the three things top of your priority list? I don't know whether you have dogs. They probably don't remember you. Um, but like walking the dogs or going to the beach or what? what is it? Um, so I've, I've got quite a young family at home. Uh, my daughters are four and two. So fortunately, you know, they could come out and, and they came quite a bit on tour with me. Uh, you know, school's not such a, a big thing at, at that age, I suppose. And it's not like in the UK where you get actually fined if you take them out of the schools. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I was fortunate that, that they could come with, with me, you know, for quite a few of the tours. But, you know, for me, as soon as I got home, it's just the small things for me, like taking my daughter to school every single day, you know, being able to drop her off every single day at school, taking her to her dance classes, their swimming lessons. You know, it's just those small things like that. Um, the dogs do bark at me when I get home. They've got no clue who I am anymore. <laughs> um, but, but that's okay. At least it shows me that they're doing the job and they're, they're still securing the place. Um, but for me, it's, it's just when I'm away for so much, it's just trying to spend as much time with, with my family as possible. Um, you know, that's, why this is why I'm doing it is for the family and, and for their future. And, um, you know, for me just to be home for six, seven weeks at a time and just try and spend as much time as possible with them there. And then on your second half of the question about us facing Australia and England, that is a bit of a tough one. I'm not going to lie. Um, it was almost like they said to you, said to us, okay, we're going to chuck you in the group with Australia and England, but we're going to base you in Barbados and Antigua. So, you know, it'll be okay. Um, at least we'll have a good time there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but hey, stranger things have happened. I mean, we we took down at that stage the Asia Cup champions in Sri Lanka in the last World Cup. Um, you know, it, it's going to be tough for this time. But England have a bit of a reputation of losing to to minor teams in a World Cup. I mean, Ireland's done it to them if, before. Um, Netherlands have also. So you never know. Um, we could go there, and everything could be in our favour. Conditions could just work out perfectly, and we could cause a shock. Um, but it's, it's going to be tough for us. It's, it's, it's going to be one of those massive learning curve tournaments. And I think it's also going to put things in perspective for a lot of the Namibian guys, like what it is like to play at that top level and to, to play against the best in the world. And what's on the horizon leading into that, David? What's the preparation for yourself individually and for Namibia to get to that point where you go to Barbados and Antigua and take on the, the world, uh, world T20? So the one tough thing for Namibia is that we don't always get the, the opportunities that we'd like to to actually prep for tournaments. Um, fortunately, this this time around, we, we're going to Oman at the end of this month now to play five T20s mm. there against Oman. Um, and that takes us to middle April, and then we'll have a month of just prepping at home before we leave for the World Cup. Uh, me, personally, I'm signed up here to play again for the Titans, a team that I played for you know locally for 10 years before I signed Colpac. Um, you know, I'm just going to play a bit of the CSA T20 local cup over here just to stay with it, you know, just to keep with game time. I find um, for me, especially with the older bones now, if I stop for too long, then it kind of hurts a bit too much when I when I start up again. So, so it's good to, to just keep on ticking over the whole time. So yeah, I'll just be getting as much game time as I possibly can uh, leading into that World Cup. David Visa, thanks so much for your time. Thanks you for joining us. Congratulations on the podcast. Hopefully it was a little bit of therapy um, in between all the practicing and the training. Hitman for hire, a year in the life of a franchise cricketer. Enjoy the few days off that you've got. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, Namibian all-rounder David Visa speaking to us after the launch of his podcast, Hitman for hire, a year in the life of a franchise cricketer. You're listening to Following On here on Talk Sport 2 with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. And next up, uh, Talk Sports cricket editor John Norman will join us for his weekly feature. And this week, he'll be discussing or raising the topic of uh, the life and dreams of a journeyman red ball cricketer. OK, uh, it's time for a little bit of boss whimsy here. Talk Sport cricket editor John Norman joins us uh, for his uh, weekly uh, thoughts and Harmony and I are completely intrigued by this having just spoken to David Visa um, hitman for hire a year in the life of a franchise cricketer John 
is uh, imagining something different. The life and dreams of a journeyman red ball cricketer. John. Mm, yes, absolutely. I think, uh, well, look, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, to hearing David Visa chat. And I suppose, in, uh, in a way, it, it is completely linked to what I wanted to talk about on the show today. Um, and to get Harmy's thoughts, really, and yourselves, Manners, reading your Substack page about the way that the game's changing in South Africa, the, um, uh, the domestic situation there, uh, cut adrift from uh, the SA20 and the riches and, uh, of course, the international game. I, like a lot of cricket tragics, find myself at night, especially in this day and age, because it's not all, uh, it's not, not all worse now than it used to be. But last night, I settled in for uh, a good 20 minutes or so of uh, the top of the table clash between Northern Districts against Canterbury. Uh, the Plunkett Shield is coming to the end of its um, season. Just a couple of games to go. Northern Districts are at the top of the table. And uh, they're playing Canterbury. Canterbury are out. Wellington are the only real challengers to Northern Districts. Uh, a side that haven't won the Plunkett Shield since 2011 which was actually, coincidentally, the year that Radio Sport uh, decided that they weren't going to broadcast live ball-by-ball coverage of it. So uh, nowadays you can, of course, watch all the matches on YouTube and sometimes you get really lucky and the sound operator or the cameraman or camerawoman has actually left the sound on. So you get the sound of the cicadas and the traffic in the background and the wind and it's always windy in New Zealand. And uh, you sit back and there's no commentary afforded to the service, so it is just visual. But you find yourself just watching uh, a fixed camera position as uh, many whites go about their business in exactly the same way that they have done for 100 years in New Zealand. And it kind of it allows you to dip back into the past and watch a game of cricket as it has always been. And I, like most people, found myself looking at some of these bowlers um, and batters and just wondering what their story was. Now, Northern Districts have got some players with familiar names. You've got uh, Jeet Raval, who played about 25 tests in New Zealand. Uh, Scott Guggelheim took six wickets. Uh, he, of course, played in the test series, and, and we, we commentated on him last year. Tim Seifert, uh, the wicketkeeper bat who uh, plays T20 cricket for New Zealand. But they're not the guys I want to talk about. I want to talk about Christian Clark and Joe Carter and Brett Hampton and Joseph Walker. And Henry He's a Cooper. former world heavyweight and champion, that's Manners about as far as I got. You, like me, have heard <laughs> nothing of these players. Um, Henry Cooper? And the chances... Henry Cooper, yeah, go go for it. Tell me about Henry Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, uh, he's looking good for it because he's also uh, 30 years old. Um, and uh, fresh from taking on Mo- Muhammad Ali, he's, uh, he's an opening... <laughs> He's an opening bat, part-time bowler, 58 matches. And these are all one-club men. Henry Cooper, Joseph Walker, Brett Hampton and Joe Carter are all in their 30s. They've only ever played for Northern Districts. They've never played for New Zealand. And whilst Christian Clark may dream too, he's just 23, um, the chances are they will just play professional cricket for Northern Districts. And, and that will be it. And it just got me thinking, Harmy, about what these types of characters are like. Because from the outset, growing up, if someone was to say to you that you could earn your living playing professional sport for your county, well, that would be a success in itself. Dreams are made of far less. But they do have an image, don't they, of journeyman cricketers who've never actually played international cricket that maybe is a little bit unfair. And it's also one, and this is where I'm coming to with the point, that maybe we're kind of moving on and moving away from these kinds of players. Because, of course, the dream for the journeyman cricket was to one day play for his country. But now, of course, it's very different because you can make riches and gain fame from playing T20 cricket, much like David Visa has. Although, of course, he has played international cricket as well. And I'm just wondering whether you, Harmy, with your connections to Durham, have just noticed um, a difference in the types of characters that maybe the game is appealing to now, Um, whether you're noticing a difference in the way that these types of characters walk around the county scene, Um, and whether there is a difference within the setups of these counties, be it northern districts or the most northern 
most county in uh, the, the, uh, the county championship. The answer, the, the, um, and whether indeed the easy answer things is, have for changed, me, the best people or whether they're just going to continue you know, as the, they always the have been that I played with for the last hundred Durham. years or so. In and times are changing. Yeah, you're right. And I think, I think this is where a lot of it gets missed about first class cricket in this country in England. Is that yes, we want, we don't. Uh, we all argue about four different competitions where we argue about the hundred and what it's doing for first class cricket and the need for it all to become, you know, flow in such a, such a way where it's better for, for supporters, it's better for players, but it's also what, and some of the best players I played with, some of the best characters I played with, we're never going to play international cricket and they've missed their chance of playing, making the money that would probably they would, they would make around the world in the franchises because they've come late. I'm thinking the likes of, you know, someone like Gordon Mutchell, who is a, you know, fantastically talented cricketer. Um, a, a school teacher now, John Lewis, not not the John Lewis that coach, well, he does coach the England women's team, but not the bowling coach. John Lewis, the same, gone round to, you know, Essex, came to Durham. Oh, you know, these players are, you know, great characters, you know, great people to have on your side, in your dressing room. Um, and they were, they were only ever going to play first class cricket. And then, you know, their dream was to play for England. And if they didn't play for England, it was to provide for their family. And I think sometimes that gets misunderstood when we talk about franchise cricket, we talk about the blast and we talk about the hundred. You know, there's, there's a lot of players, a lot of, a lot of players who have made their name and their careers by, by being the cricketer that you've mentioned there and listed there for Northern Districts, John. And that, sometimes gets left behind when people just poo-poo first-class cricket, when people just look down their nose and say, you know, what, what's the point of Derbyshire and what's the point of Northampton and what's the point of Leicestershire? Well, the point is that they are producing players who are earning a living, who are giving a service to members. And yes, the, the, it might not be as fashionable as the 100 and putting 10,000, you know, Seats in in Trent Bridge and playing on a a night time when twenty overs or fifteen overs and you know you know the the music and the razzmatazz that goes with it, but I think you you've got to remember is you know some of these players are the best players that your your county have ever had because they've never been away from your county, they've been the county player who has spent and that's what the testimonial and the benef benefit system was for, it wasn't for. You know, Andrew Flintoff in 2006 to have the benefit after the 2005 Ashes or Paul Collingwood had one at Durham straight after. I had one in 2013. It's for the likes of Chris Rushworth, who's who's given his, his whole career to, you know, he's not always going to Warwickshire and took more wickets than anybody else. Simon Brown, my hero, one of my heroes growing up into that team, played one test match. John Lewis, like I mentioned before, these benefits and testimonials are rewards because they didn't have the franchise system to go to make their money around. So I think there's still an old school mentality when it's like that, looking at that. And I still think they're relevant. And I still think it's poignant that these people who are earning a living playing cricket um, are still should be accepted as, um, and not just looked down their noses at and go, well, you know, why, what's the point of having these, these smaller counties when we can have 10, 10 franchises and just blow first class cricket away I think sometimes that gets misunderstood and gets left behind. And what you're talking about now, I think what we what we, the point we're getting to for me is that players are now getting rewarded, you know, for being yeah you know, longevity. You know, their 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 careers of well, if you didn't play a Test cricket, then you didn't earn a great deal of money. Now the money in the franchise system, they're getting a chance to earn that little bit more, which I for me is is all more better. So. You're not living the 19 to 24, going to play for England dream, and then 24 to 30, mid 30s, if you can see your career out and maybe get a benefit at the end of it, and that's your days done. Now they're getting rewarded. There's a lot more opportunities around the world, which is great. So I think there's a there's definitely a place for both, um, and you know, and I think that sometimes gets left behind when people just try to cancel first-class cricket in this country. John, I've known you for 20 years, and I don't think we've ever spoken about this, but you've inadvertently stumbled on one of probably my second greatest hate in, in cricket. My first is players who say, that's the way I play. My second <laughs> is people who judge cricketers for a perceived lack of ambition. It 
absolutely gets into my blood. I mean, you know, it's I, I'm actually later on this evening, I'm speaking at a club and several of those club players turned down the chance to play provincial cricket because they were happy playing club cricket. One's a lawyer, so he's going to earn a lot more money anyway. But this perception that we have that everybody should have the ambition to play for England, it's its wrong, isn't it? It's plain, plain wrong. I mean, you work in the news building. What percentage of the people there are in front of a microphone? You don't have to aspire uh, to do something that doesn't make you comfortable. I'm thinking about... Mark Lathwell, um, and and there have been a few, haven't they? They've tasted international cricket and just gone, no, not for me. I'm happy doing my thing in Taunton. And I find it deeply comforting and satisfying watching solid professional cricketers who have no desire to travel six months of the year, who are perfectly happy, not happy, deeply satisfied playing first-class cricket And, you know, when I need a tonic, when I'm feeling a bit down, I'll go find myself a club game and just go and lie on the boundary's edge and just watch people playing cricket for the love of it. Just just quickly on that, to finish off my experience. When I first got into the England team, I was having a real struggle of going away. And, you know, I had a young family. I had things going on mentally that I didn't understand. You know, I was suffering from depression. I didn't understand it. And I missed the tour. And then, obviously, we all know the story of going to West Indies and stuff like that. But I was in a position going, well, what's the worst thing can happen to me? I don't play for England. I'll play for Durham for the next 10, 15 years. I'll be the best county cricketer I possibly can be. I'll be Durham's record wicket taker. I'll go and break record for Durham and win leagues for Durham and try my best for Durham. It's not going to make me a, be- a worse off person. I'm actually loving the game. I just don't love the travel anymore. I didn't understand the travel bit. But my, my, my all, f- the sort of feel safe, go back thing is, I've got three children at home I've got to provide for. I've got mortgage to pay. How do I pay that mortgage? I'd be the best cricketer I possibly can be. But unfortunately, I don't really want to go away from home. So I, I, I give up playing one day cricket. I give up. 2006, I give. I retired from one-day cricket. I had no interest in going travelling the world again and being brought out every third game when we couldn't get a... We got we conceded 300 or we needed somebody to bowl fast at somebody. I, I give up on that because, you know, that life was more important to me. And that that was that was always my thought process, that at the end of the day, it, it, going to play for England was great. I loved it. But it wasn't the be-all and end-all. You know, I look. I was actually felt more under pressure, John. If I'm really honest, I felt more under pressure playing cricket for Durham than I did for England, because there were times where your your mates, like you play with your mates. I felt as though I was playing with mates for Durham, and I was put together with England, but I was also put together with Durham. But I was times, you know, after tea. I remember one game after tea, it, it, uh, for Durham against Kent. You know, Keezy, and Keezy was batting. We needed nine wickets in the last session. And I could, I could see Dale Benkenstein looking at me going, just give me four overs. But I could also see the team going, come on, England bowler, you've got to bowl them out. I'm like, we're nine wickets, they're not going to win that. And what we do, we, we won the game. We won we won the game. I only got back two or three wickets. I'll, there's another story on that for, for later on years to come with Robbie Joseph, but he wouldn't want me to tell it. But these these pressures, you know, these pressures are, are what I felt in the dressing room. But I love that pressure because I love playing cricket. With people who, you know, I remember Duncan Fletcher having a go at me. Was it Fletcher or was it Moores having a go at me? Because I played in Friends Provident quarter final, I think it was. And I was, I'd been injured. And I was like, no, I'm going to play. Because in my eyes, I get to play at Lords every now and again in front of 30,000 people. But, you know, I'm going to, I want to, I want to give my teammates the best chance of possibly having their only day out at Lords. You know, and that's that for me was what drove me forward. And I, I don't know. I think I just think, like you said before, these people that play and don't play cricket for England, they play because they love the game. They're not worse or better than anybody else when you're 15 growing up trying to get into a first class team. What a good topic, John. Thank you. Bit of bomb boss whimsy. 
Hey, do you, before we sign off and like, good luck pro- uh, editing that down, Scott Taylor, the producer. Do you want one little uh, factoid about Joe Carter and Brett Hampton? Yes, please. In 2018, they broke the world record for the number of runs scored off one over. 43. Uh, are we going to save that for next week or are you going to put us out of our misery now? Uh, How did they do that? There were a lot of wides. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, a, and a couple of no balls in there. Which got the dis- which went the distance. So between them, they broke the world record. I I, I haven't got a breakdown. That that'll <laughs> have to wait for next week. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, John. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get him back next week if he's got another topic as uh, as good as that one. You're listening to Following On with me, Neil Mantle, alongside former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. Next up, we'll round up the week's other big stories and hear exclusively from Kent Whiteball captain Sam Billings ahead of the start of the new season. You're listening to Following On with me, Neil Manthorpe, alongside Double Ashes winner Steve Harmison. And a reminder, you can now watch us on YouTube as well. Just head over to the TalkSport Cricket YouTube channel to subscribe. Right now, uh, let's hear from Sam Billings. The 2024 county season is just a couple of weeks away now. County Championship starts early next month. Uh, let's hear from uh, Sam Billings, who's been speaking to TalkSport's Josh Keeble-Wells ahead of the new season. Now, remember, Billings has uh, signed a white ball only contract this season. I've had a period of probably three, four years where I've tried to kind of balance everything out and, and try and spread myself across all, all three formats, trying to play test cricket for England, trying to play limited overs stuff. Um, and it was just completely unsustainable. Um, so it became a grind. It became unenjoyable. And um, I think like anything in life, it's... It, as soon as you lose that enjoyment factor, um, it yeah something has to change. So I think perfect timing, uh, life change, obviously becoming a father for the first time and uh, being able to spend my time at home as well when obviously during the winter I'm, I'm away so much as well. So uh, for me, um, yeah, it, it just seemed like a really kind of positive decision. Um, a tough one, of course, but uh, yeah. I think Test cricket for me that that ship sailed. So, uh, so it was seeing what I needed to do to kind of focus on my career. You obviously mentioned the little one there, but you also mentioned being in and around the England sides and the limited over stuff. That must be another contribution to the decision you've made. But potentially a push for the T Twenty World Cup, maybe. Yeah, potentially. You never know. Yeah, potentially. I, I think I'm I'm also in a really nice headspace in terms of. Um, not putting too much pressure on myself. I think the opportunities that we have now uh, as a player around the world are incredible. Um, Pass, unfortunately, the other side of 30 now, and uh, you get to a stage of your career where you just want to win as much as possible in terms of trophies, in terms of silverware, and yeah, having won three in the last calendar year, uh, for me, you know, that's, that's a huge driving force and being able to give absolutely everything I can to kind of do that. Um, yeah, as a byproduct, if I get recalled for an England, um, England recall for the, for the World Cup, absolutely. Um, but it's kind of not my priority and, and focus as such. Um, so, yeah, I'm playing as well as I have done in a long time. So uh, that's, been, that's been really positive uh, over the last few months. That was Talk Sports' Josh Keeble-Wells speaking to Kent Whiteball captain Sam Billings there. Uh, well, like um, Josh Butler, he's interested in playing in America, Harmy. And do you know what? <laughs> I think you'd be in a, in a very small minority if you weren't interested in playing in the Major League uh, cricket. It's, uh, it's got a certain attraction to it, doesn't it? Yeah, it has. It's As much as Canterbury is a very, very nice place in the middle of the summer, you know, New York, Philadelphia, <laughs> but there are, yeah. There are worse places to be shipwrecked to play cricket. So, look, yeah, Sam's a great lad. And I think, unfortunately for Sam, he was... He, there's no guilt to this. There's no... He was guilty of this. He was just... He's such a nice guy who got, you know, hauled around the world as England's, you know, backup batter, backup keeper, backup fielder, backup sort of top man being, you know, good in the dressing room. And unfortunately his career stuttered a little bit because he didn't play as many 
cricket matches as he probably should. Is that his fault? No. You know, it just shows you the talent that he had, that he was on England's radar. He just didn't force his way into the team. Um, I think he's a brilliant cricketer. I still think there's there's mileage in him yet. I still think there's I I think there's another game in England in the in the shortest format, whether it be fifty overs or T twenty format for him yet. And he's got to try and force his way back in. Um, but you're right, who wouldn't want to be part of this, you know, major league cricket if it does take off because you know, it's been the promised land for so long now, Manners. Uh, America can it get off the ground. And, you know, Sam Billings with his IPL experience and his franchise tournament experience around the world, he would definitely be a big coup for the for that Major League cricket. I know it could still stumble and stutter, but hasn't it taken off? I know it's only been one season, but there seems to be financial backing. And, you know, it. I mean, for for a one-season tournament or a tournament into its first season, it does feel quite stable for the first time. Yeah, it does seem as though it's the first time in a long time that we are getting to a point where the Americans are serious. Yeah, And it's not just one sort of little corner of America. It's, you know, four corners of of the um, of the country that, you know, from one side, you know, Philadelphia on the, obviously on the, on the West Coast and, and obviously New York on the East Coast, there's, there's, there's cricket being played all around America and, and now I think it probably is. It's not, I don't think it's, after one year, I don't think it's anywhere near as strong as what you were talking about, the SA20, but I think the history with South African cricket is why the SA20, you know, kicked on and and was a, an instant success because there was, a, there was a history towards South African cricket. But I think first impressions, I think um, I don't think ML, uh, MLC cricket is going anywhere anytime soon. I think it's here to stay, and I think once it adds a couple of teams, got Ricky Ponton, got some big, big more, more money and backers. I can see this league going from strength to strength, and that would be a concern from English cricket point of view because of the timing of the year that they will they will obviously going to be playing. Okay, another story that caught my attention, um, and I did watch uh, a good part of the game. RCB finally win the Indian Premier League, except that it's the Women's Premier League. So Royal Challengers Bangalore, women do what Virat Kohli and AB de Villiers were unable to do in a dozen years of trying. <laughs> the, apart from the cricket itself, and they condemned uh, the Delhi Capitals to their second successive loss in a, in a one side, hev- heavily one-sided eight-wicket win. Um, <clears throat> but I think it was, the, it was the celebration and the aftermath. And then... Looking at uh, the Hindu newspaper and uh, the the Mumbai Express and, and back, seeing it front page, back page news, inside page news, just seeing that, I mean, we're getting a bit tired of saying it now. Women's cricket's been here to stay for a long time, but this just seemed to take it to another level. It does, yeah. And I think it started with, no, I wouldn't say it started with 100 because I think, you know, a few of the women cricketers would shoot me down. And I think they would say that it's always <laughs> been you know, at, at a decent level. But I think... I think the hundred for if it's done one good thing, it's it's promoted and it's got women's cricket to a level where now India is taking it seriously and to a, a, the next level. And where does it go from here? I really enjoy watching the women's game. I think technically the, you know, I think some of the women's cricketers are you know technically better than you know than than a lot of the male counterparts. Um, but it's it is it's. I, 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 because of because I've I've always enjoyed watching you know junior cricketers and youth cricketers develop their game and see them because they haven't got the power and the strength finding ways of getting the ball around the field and over the field. Uh, that for me is is there's I look at it and go you know what there's more ways to skin a cat in hitting the ball a hundred meters out of the ground and going at eight and over because you can do it along the floor or you can do it with complete precision. And that's what, for me, the the technical side of the women's game, and that was evident throughout that tournament. I watched a few games in that tournament, and it was was really, really good. So the the women's game's going, it's frightening where, I think it's frightening where it could be in five to 10 years' time. Okay, a couple of bits of news out of the ICC annual meeting. Um, the World Cups in, in future semifinals and for the World T Twenty, uh, the T Twenty World Cup semifinals and final will both have a reserve day, and sensibly ten yeah. overs will be the minimum 
required to decide a game. Um, I'm more interested in your thoughts on the stop clock being added as a permanent feature. Uh, just to remind uh, listeners and viewers that uh, this means you've got no longer than 60 seconds of teen overs, um, three offences, if you take longer than 60 seconds, uh, then uh, you get penalised five runs. Interestingly, in the three-month trial period, no team was penalised, um, but they, they they had a couple of warnings. A couple of teams would, did take longer than 60 seconds of clean overs, but uh, no more than three or twice in a, in a game. The RCC technical committee said that they reckon it could save up to, or did save up to 20 minutes per ODI, but without anybody being penalised. So that's been introduced as a permanent feature. Thoughts? Like it, really like it. Let's get the game going. It's always been, and it, it and it, it doesn't have to happen in a schoolmaster way. Headmasters telling you what to do and constantly on your case. You know, if umpires just give the captain a look. You know, just give him a look. Come on, let's get on with the game. And we want the game quicker. It's better when it's quicker. Um, so yeah, I like all that. You know, from from the ICC, and hopefully, uh, it can be. It, it, the only the only time it gets sort of pushed to the limits is when the pressure's on, you know, when the ball's going around the park and the the, the bowler and the captain are under pressure. Um, just buy yourself some time and do things earlier, do it quicker earlier, and you'll you'll get away with it. But you know, for me, first impressions, yes, that's a, a good initiative which needs to stay in the game. Okay, we're on to the final word now, and it's funny that you should have mentioned school teacher there, because I've got a couple of uh, offerings for you, Harmi. I don't know whether anything uh, has qualified for last minute, uh, last word, final word uh, qualification from you. But so, first of all, Andy Balberni, given our LBW in the second T20 against Afghanistan in Sharjah, uh, just politely pointing out to the umpire that actually the ball hit his glove first. Um, you know, uh, and he's been fined 15% of his match fee, given one demerit point, like with the least tr- troublesome international cricketer mm. out there. And I just thought, and he, and he just didn't seem to do it in such a sort of polite way, you know, no, 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 it, actually it hit my glove. Um, and and the, the, the full umpiring team have reported him. And uh, so he's ended up in the headmaster's study and having to stand in the corner of the classroom. Um, I did. I wondered whether that was. I understand why the rules were introduced. The laws were changed, um, uh, but I thought that was met perhaps going a bit too far. And then I thought, how about MS Dhoni? He'll be turning forty-three at the end of this IPL. It's the seventeenth edition, isn't yeah. it? He's played in all of them, um, and he hasn't played since last year's final. Hasn't played a game since last year's final, and is going to be <laughs> starting again. I mean, he must have had a lot of time in the nets, I suppose. You'd think you'd have some time in the nets, but you know, no one M and S Tony probably hasn't. He's just so laid back. He's, he's probably just he's probably he's probably as we speak looking for his wee keeping pads because he hasn't seen them for the best part of twelve months. But I've got <laughs> no doubt he'll be he'll be you know there at the end of an innings, and you wouldn't bank on him getting your team. If he is there at an innings, you wouldn't bank his on getting uh, CSK over the line because he does it so many times. It's brilliant to see. I'm with you on the Aldi, Andy Van Bernie one. It did look really sort of so apologetic by by just tapping his gloves in. I think you've made a mistake there. It, it, it hit my glove. But so, you know, two wrongs, <laughs> two wrongs definitely don't make a right because not only did the umpire get it wrong with the decision, he actually got it wrong by fining the Indian, uh, the, the island captain. And I've got one for you, man, is the final word. Uh, I quite enjoyed the celebration from Sri Lanka when the uh, when they won, we went in front of the sponsors' board and they had the uh, the broken helmet because of obviously there was a there was a little altercation I think during the series when uh, a wicket celebration was met by a little point to the uh, a point to a, a wrist for a clock. So the Angelo Matthews vendetta spat you know argument. Is still rumbling on between Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. I quite enjoyed the celebration. <laughs> it was very, very good. Just to confirm, when Sri Lanka uh, won, they, they played two white ball series. Uh, when they, Sri Lanka won the ODIs, uh, they celebrated by all pointing to their watches. And then when Bangladesh won the T20s, they all celebrated around a broken helmet. So they, um, plenty of um, <clears throat> schoolboy antics there. Uh, but great fun. And as you, uh, as you say, very... A fitting addition to this week's final word. And we have finally run out of time. 
Um, you've been listening to Following On with me, Neil Manthorpe, along with former England fast bowler Steve Harmison. If you've missed any of the show or you want to catch up, you can download the podcast from the Following On feed, now available via the free TalkSport app or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for your company once again. We'll be back at the cinema time next week for another busy show. But for now, this has been another edition of Following On. On AM, on DAB, via the TalkSport app and on your smart speaker. TalkSport.